So before John starts, I just want to warn you of something that you may already be aware of. You may be wondering, like, why all this stuff is being set up across the street by the football stadium. So the Dead and Company, which is like the modern incarnation of the Grateful Dead rock band, is having three concerts here tomorrow and the next night and the next night. And they're starting to set everything up. So if you're here till tomorrow, lingering, you may just notice the crowds and all this stuff going on. So that. That's, it'll be hard to miss, but that's what's going on in case you're wondering what they're preparing for. All right, you ready to go, John? All right, so we're pleased to have the last lecture from John McGreevy and the last lecture from this year's TASI. So, John, take it away. Take, take, take us home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Oliver. Um, okay, so I, t today's lecture is about entanglement bootstrap. And let me remind you, what we said was the principal entanglement bootstrap principle is that all of the universal information about a phase of matter, and here I'm using the word universal in, in the sense of Wilson, meaning a property of a phase. Sometimes it's used, particularly in discussions of CFT, CFT to mean properties that are independent of which CFT you talk about. But that's like a super universality. I'm just talking about smaller thing, properties of a phase. All the universal information is contained in the reduced Einstein matrix of a ball. OK, of a, of a, of a, and this, I guess I should say, this is the reduced Einstein matrix on the ball of uh, some representative wave function. So this is some representative of the phase. Recall our picture of of uh, space of all states, uh, yeah, maybe. Okay, it's something like this. There's walls separating the phases, and um, okay. And and I'd like. Um, it'll be useful if we keep in mind some idea. At least maybe I should just just in, in the interest of full disclosure, everything I'm saying I'm imagining that uh, there's some underlying lattice with a tensor product Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. And the ball that I'm thinking of is some, basically as big as you want, uh, ball in this in this lattice. Yeah, so this let's call it B. That's probably not big enough, but um, for what we're going to do. But imagine that I drew a bigger lattice. Okay. So the first thing to notice is that this principle implies that there should should exist local conditions, local conditions on the state that tell us which kind of phase of matter the state represents. So this is a very crude thing. Like, is it a, ga a gap ground state representing some topological order? Is it a CFT ground state? Is it an excited state? Uh, that kind of thing. There should be local conditions that, uh, uh, yeah, for each, and, and I guess it's not wrong to call it for each category. So by category, I mean uh, things like what I was just enumerating. And uh, yeah, so today I'm going to we're going to start by, yeah, OK, so, so, so the idea is, the idea of this program is, first you figure out what are the local conditions for, for the category that you're interested in. We're going to start with liquid topological order. And then you use those conditions. You imagine you have a wave function satisfying those conditions and try to use it, figure out how to extract the information from it, how to extract the universal information from it. So we're going to start with uh, liquid topological order. This, means we're, this word means no fractons. We'll start in 2 plus 1 dimensions for definiteness. And, uh, and then. At some point in the lecture, hopefully, we'll get to talk about the case of 1 plus 1 DCFT also. And OK, so you might be wondering, why is this an interesting thing to do? Uh, you've already had you know, many lectures about topological field theory. But an important thing to emphasize is that topological field theory is an empty shell. It's an empty shell waiting to be filled with the data, with the universal data that determines all the amplitudes. Meng did a wonderful job of explaining, in the case of 2 plus 1 dimensional topological field theory, what is that data? that you need to determine, to specify what, uh, in a finite way, what uh, topological field theory you're talking about. Um, so that's, that's one role that this machine can play to fill in that empty shell. But the second, I think, more important role is to figure out what the shell should be. Right? So in the case of 2 plus 1 dimensions, I think we're pretty sure what's going on. But in higher dimensions, I think the situation is much, much more open. And uh, we'll see that there's really quite a wilderness, even in, in 3 plus 1 dimensions, liquid, liquid topological order. OK, so we'll start in. Start in 2 plus 1D uh, for now. And, 
And let me tell you the two conditions. There's, so, okay, let me tell you the conditions uh, that if someone hands you a wave function, you can check, and it's a, these conditions are a sufficient condition, are sufficient for it to represent such a liquid topological order in two plus one dimensions. Um, and they were discovered by uh, Bowen Shi and Isaac Kim, and uh, they're, they're called A0 and A1, and they're just conditions on entanglement entropies of parts of a ball. So for A0, we pick a small ball inside our bigger ball. I don't know, it should be, it should be a little bigger, but it could be you know, like that. Um, and divide it into its thickened boundary and its interior. So let's call this C and this B. And the condition is just that the following combination of entanglement entropies vanishes. It's, uh, it's well, okay, it's S, B, C. Okay, let me, okay, actually, you know what, I'll, let's do this one first. This one is very similar. See, here we, we just divide the thickened boundary into three parts. And this one is zero is SBC plus SCD minus SB minus SD. And this one is the same, but you just leave out D. So it's SBC plus SC minus SB. Okay, so these combinations of entropies will appear all the time. So let me call this one delta of BC. That's just a name for this combination of entropies. And, I'm gonna, and this one, I'm going to call delta of BCD. So delta BC is delta BC empty set. Okay. Um, all right. So so I need to I need to spend a few minutes explaining why it's a good idea to impose these conditions on a state. So one thing I mentioned last time is that a state representing such a phase should satisfy an area law for the entanglement entropy of a, of a disk. And one thing and and there's a subleading term which is universal and interesting. One thing you can notice about these combinations of entropies is that the area law terms all cancel. So the, the area law term is non-universal, but it completely disappears from these, from these expressions. Okay. Um, the next thing to say is to try to draw some, draw some conclusions from them. Uh, let's think about A0 first. So one thing that A0 implies is, is the following, and this is a, a key trick that we're gonna use over and over again. So if, um, okay, so let's imagine that we uh, purify our state. So this disk BC is appearing somewhere in this B. Uh, BC has a complement in B. That's, that's and the, the, the whole thing is some mixed state. Let's imagine I just attach something to it. Yeah, I'm gonna attach something, some extra degrees of freedom to make a pure state of the whole thing. And the reason I'm doing that is because then I can do the following maneuver. Uh, let's call it, yeah, let's call it A, I don't know, A prime. Uh, A prime here is everything in the world except for B and C. It's the complement of, of this little disk BC in this whole pure state. And the fact that, okay, and it's a fact that in, in a pure state, yeah, I'm just using the fact that in a pure state, the entanglement entropy of A is the same as the entanglement entropy of its complement. So if you use this fact a couple of times, you can check that you can see this identity. Oh, where? Where this is the mutual information between A prime and C, which is defined to be uh, S A prime C minus S A prime minus S C. Did I get the sign right? It's a sign I'm supposed to know by now. Yeah, I got it right. Okay. Um, and, and now, the next step is that, so this A prime is, is this you know, huge region that involves this little doohickey that I added there. We don't, we don't really care about that. But the next thing is that we can use strong subadditivity, which is just a fact about entanglement entropies on states that make sense, to trace out part of A prime. So here A is, so here's, here's, our, picture, here's our little ball. B, is, B everywhere in this, in this lecture stands for buffer. And, and A here is anything, any subset of the complement of, of BC. So A prime is this you know, vast swirling wilderness out here. But from the fact that this combination of entropies vanishes, we learn that the mutual information between this guy and anything outside of the disk vanishes exactly. Okay, so that's, okay, so there's a very similar conclusion from A1, just basically exactly the same set of logic uh, oh, yeah, right, sorry. So this, is, so this is a positive quantity, by the way. 
which is bounded above by zero, therefore it's zero. Right? That was the conclusion of that argument. And a similar argument says that this is equal to conditional mutual information between A and C given B, where again, uh, uh, well, we're now in this, in this picture, sorry for the overloading of notation, now I'm using A1, uh, B, you know, here, um, so this is true for any combination of regions where B buffers A from C. Okay, so what did we learn from this? We learned that this is actually a very strict condition on the state. Because this mutual information between regions, it bounds, uh, bounds from above the correlation functions of any operators supported in those regions. Yeah, so this, I'm not going to write the exact equation, but it's uh, with some appropriate normalization. Uh, it I guess it bounds the square of the connected, yeah, connected correlation functions. Um, okay, there's a one half. Um, and so, so what does this mean? It says that the correlation length of a state satisfying these conditions is exactly zero. So it's a very strong condition, right? If most wave functions that, that you pick up off the street don't have that property. Um, and similarly, this condition, the fact that the condition initial information between A and C Given B, where B is a buffer between A and C, it says that the state is a quantum Markov chain. Okay, and I guess the most important uh, message I want to convey by using those words is that there's some big machinery from quantum information theory that can be brought to bear, which, which will be brought to bear behind the scenes in this lecture. <laughs> yeah? It's wrong. Yeah, I knew there was a high probability, not quite 50%, but uh, <laughs> order one that it was wrong. Thank you. Um, that's, a good, that's the reason that I don't remember what the sign <laughs> is. Yes, exactly. The, co the comment was that minus zero is equal to zero, yes. <laughs> right. Um, okay, good. Yeah, so the, so the picture is, yeah, so the, the um, what is it called? Uh, the t-shirt that a quantum, the, the thing that's on the t-shirt that the qu a quantum Markov chain wears is this picture, right? So the idea is B buffers A from C. And this is related to that by a topological deformation, by a smooth deformation. Okay, so uh, now I've, I've just asked some very strong conditions on the state, and why is that okay, given, given the, the broad goal that I stated? Um, and to answer that, I need to appeal to the renormalization group. Um, okay, I wish that weren't quite so high. Let me draw the let me draw the picture again. So the idea is this, the space of phases of matter is divided up into these chambers, each of which represents. Let's talk about gapped phases. And I claim that each one of these gapped phases has a special point in it. It's a special point, which is a fixed point of the normalization group, which is attractive. A unique attractive fixed point with correlation length zero. So all of the flows in any one of these regions goes to a unique point. And that's, that's the state that exactly satisfies these conditions. So if someone hands you a different state, if someone hands you this state, what do you do? Well, what you do is you just back up and look at bigger regions, right? Because that's what this arrow is doing, right? This, these are arrows of renormalization group flow, which say that as you zoom out and coarse grain your description of the system, you you know, you follow one of these curves, and the claim is that if you study bigger and bigger regions, eventually you get to this point. Okay, so that's, that's the, the logic behind imposing these exact conditions. And um, there's a uh, mathematical problem, which is not yet solved, which is to, yeah, so, so I said we're gonna use the machinery of quantum Markov chains. There's also a machinery of, machinery of approximate quantum Markov chains, which, which was what we would need to do to study this, this point instead. Uh, exactly, and that's less well developed, and it's an open mathematical problem to uh, redo everything I'm going to say uh, using approximate Markov chains. Okay, so so far we have these these two conditions, which, although they impose very strict uh, requirements on our state, they're, they're they seem very special, right? It's a statement about uh, about you know round balls and so on. Just, just to make sure I understand, these are the conditions on a state for which taking the density matrix will have will tell you what you want. That's right. You should think of these as, as someone hands you a state. You want to know, does it represent a liquid topological state of li liquid topological order? You check these conditions. If it does, then it's, a, it's it, for sure. So in general, these things obey inequalities. So it's only That's right. That's right. 
exact very special states, which are which are these. These. Yeah, these are the ones that satisfy it exactly. Okay. Great. So the first thing to notice is that these axioms are self-reproducing. So what I mean by that is we've we're satisfying these conditions on say small round balls. Okay, don't, don't these and these. Well, it's, 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 it's a cartoon of that. I just, you know, I, it's, you're supposed to remember that it's a picture of that. Right? It's, actually, to be honest, you know, there, there's an entanglement bootstrap Slack channel. And you know how you can, on the Slack channel, you can post like, uh, icons in response to what someone says? The members of the Slack channel post a little cartoon of these axioms. <laughs> Um, yeah, when somebody says something clever. Uh, yeah, actually, one of the, yeah one of them that I really like is it's it's this one, but it's turned into a fish. Uh, I, I don't know if I can quite do it. So so the thing I'm about to show you is that if it's true for these round balls, it's also true for deformed balls, right? So it would also be true for this ball that's shaped like a fish. Uh, I guess maybe this is, C is supposed to be the I. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right, so, so right, that's exactly what I wanted to say. So if it's true for these guys, then it's also true for wig wiggly balls with the same topology. And, and the reason is simple. It's actually, again, an application of strong subadditivity. Um, maybe, m let me just say the idea. Um, so one necessary step is to be able to deform B with, while preserving C. So let's suppose we add this little B prime in here. Um, then the thing we use is just that, well, this is the case, um, but strong subadditivity says that that bounds above delta B B prime C D D prime. I didn't even, oh, there's, okay, I guess I did this one. I did this one, um, which is itself positive, right? And so if this is zero, then this is zero as well. And there's a similar idea for deforming C while fixing B. Okay, so so far we have some conditions. Suppose somebody hands you a state satisfying the conditions, what do you do? Well. One, the first thing you should think about, I don't know if it's the first thing, but one thing you can think about is the following very important concept, which is called the information convex set. Okay, and the information convex set is a machine that associates a, a, a density matrix satisfying these conditions and a region inside the ball. So, yeah, so I wish the ball looked bigger. You, you have to remember, imagine that thing is really big. So, you know, omega is some region, I don't know, the, the case, that will be interesting at first is the annulus. So suppose omega is this annulus. And the information convex set associates this to a convex set, which is called sigma of omega. We can put a subscript if we want to remember which state we're talking about, but I'm going to leave that out a lot. And it's defined to be the set of density matrices. Uh, let's call them sigma, density matrices on omega with the property that, are local, that they're locally indistinguishable. Locally indistinguishable from, from the reference state. Uh, sorry, rho is the reference state. Okay, so what do we mean by locally indistinguishable? What I mean is draw, I guess, yeah, locally indistinguishable in a slight thickening of the region, but the idea is you draw the little balls inside here, and for every little ball that you draw, the reduced density matrix of your candidate state and, and the reduced density matrix of, of the reference state have to agree. So the, the idea is, so we're, we want to think of this, this reference state that we're given as like the vacuum, right? It's like the ground state that we're trying to study. The idea is that states in the information comic set locally look like the vacuum, right? Everywhere, everywhere in this region, they look like the vacuum. But the interesting thing is that outside the region, they can do whatever, whatever the heck they want, right? So in particular, in this picture, there could be some excitation. Some, in this case, it's, it's an anion, which is attached by some string operator, the kinds of generalized symmetries oper symmetry operators we've been talking about, to some anion outside. And this, 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 this resulting state, the reduced density matrix on this annulus, if I started in a state obtained by acting with this string operator on the reference state, would, be, would produce an element of the information convex set. Because the string preserves the vacuum. Right? Think about the case of the Torah code. If I act with one of these string operators, only if it ends does it take us out of the vacuum. Okay, so that's the, that's the basic picture. And a fact about this 
So this thing is a convex set because any convex combination of states that satisfies this also satisfy it. Um, and <clears throat> the important fact about it is that it's a topological invariant. So sigma of some region, here, okay. the information convex set of some region is unchanged by deforming the region without changing its topology. Yeah? Well, the question was whether uh, the, the statement about, you're asking about the, this statement? Right, so this is a definition. This is the definition of the information convex set. And you could try to use this. The, the question is about whether this is a good idea if I'm studying gapless states. Um, and and uh, let, me, let, me, you know, let me just say, I don't know. So when I talk about CFT later, I'm actually not going to talk about the information convex set. Yeah, um, that's right. So, so indeed, this, this assumption uh, definitely says that the state is gapped. Um, correlation length is, is zero. Um, okay, so this thing is a topological invariant. It's an invariant of the, re of the topology type of the region that we consider. So there's a notion of, given, given some density matrix, there's a notion of the information coming set of an annulus. Right? I don't need to tell you which annulus. And it's also true that if, if, if this is true, then by an argument of Kataev and Preskill, if you change the density matrix within the phase, it should also not change. But this second statement, I actually don't know how to make entirely precise. Uh, sorry, this is a prime, where rho and rho prime are two states representing the same phase. Um, so that's, a, that's an expectation. So therefore, the information convex set is, is an invariant of the phase for each topology of region, right? So for any, yeah, for any, uh, uh, so in the case of two dimensions, there's an, there's, there's an information convex set for the ball, there's one for the annulus, there's one for the two-hole disk, and so on. Um, and uh, well, OK, so it's a convex set. What, is, what does that mean? Oh, yeah, maybe I should say. This equivalence here means, means two things. It means it's the same, they're the same as convex sets. They have the same topology. And it also means that given two states in here, the difference of their entropy, there's, there are states in here, there are corresponding states in here, and the difference of their entropies is the same. And, and also fidelities, the, their, their relative fidelity is also the same. OK. So what, what does a convex set look like? A convex set can, there are basically two things it can do. One is it could be a simplex, meaning that the extreme points are isolated. That's one possibility. All right, yeah, extreme points isolated, in, in which case you can make an arbitrary point just by taking convex combinations of those isolated points. Or it could look like the block ball. Right, so yeah, right, the, the space of density matrices on a qubit is a ball. Right, that's, Its boundary is the block sphere. Um, and in this case, the extreme points are the block sphere. Right, so these are two very different possibilities for that, that a convex can take. And we'll see that uh, this distinction, that we'll get different answers for different, uh, different topologies. Okay, so the first statement, I guess I should say, is that the information convex set of the ball is just one point. It's just the reduced density matrix of the reference state on the ball. And the idea is you just, you know, given, given a state that satisfies uh, this condition on the ball, you can, you can grow it. You can expand it using the axioms. And what I mean by that, so that's the first place where I'm using this, this technology. Um, the idea is, yeah, maybe I, I should explain this now. There's this, there's, there's this very, very uh, famous and difficult question called the quantum marginal problem, which is suppose you have uh, two density matrices. One of them lives on AB, and one of them lives on BC, and they agree on B. Agree on B means if you trace out A of this guy, trace of A over AB is equal to trace of C of rho BC, that's what I mean by agree. So given this situation, it's actually a very hard problem with like a capital H in the computer science sense to, to, to even ask whether there is a density matrix, rho ABC, whose marginals are this and this. Right, so the question is, does there exist rho ABC such that 
for y b is trace of root, and, and similarly for replacing b and c. The nice thing about quantum Markov chains is that they, that they solve this problem. If you, if you also know, in addition to this information, that, uh, that the state is a quantum Markov chain, there's a unique solution to this problem. It exists, and it's unique. And so that's, that's the basic thing that we're using all the time. So if I have a density matrix on a small ball, I can make, that's part of this larger ball, I can, I can make a density matrix that agrees with it on the part that was already there, but is a little bit bigger, and thereby I can expand it, and so there's, that's why there's a unique state here. Okay. The first interesting case is the one that I alluded to here. The information comic set of the annulus is a simplex. And can anybody guess what the extreme points, to, what I should associate to the extreme points? What is that? They're not. No, they're not, because it's always, you know, it's part of this larger system. They're still, they're still mixed states. So we, yeah, we want to attach some physical meaning to the, to, the, to the extreme points. And this, I urge you to look at this picture carefully. So we can attach a label to each of these x's, which is the type of anion that we're creating. And for any type of anion, we can create, we can create an extreme point by, yeah, by, by, by doing that. And so, yeah, so the idea is that these extreme points, uh, extreme points of this information comic set correspond to anion types. There's a special one, which is uh, the reduced density matrix. Uh, the, reduced, the reduced density matrix of the reference state, yeah, trace of the complement of the annulus of the reduced, original reduced density matrix, let's call that rho sub 1. That corresponds to the trivial anion type, which is always there. That corresponds to not doing anything to it. There's a special one. OK, and well, OK, so for each anion type, we have a density matrix. One thing we can read off from that. Is the, is the quantum dimension. The formula for the quantum dimension is this. S of rho A is the extreme point associated to anion type A. S of rho 1 is this, is the entropy of that guy, and there's an over 2 here. So this, if you like, this is sort of a, let's think of, we could think of this as a guess at first, a formula for the quantum dimension. What's the quantum dimension? The quantum dimension is, you make it, if you have n of the anions of type A, you pile them all together, you get some Hilbert space of some size. Right, it's always an integer. But the definition of the quantum dimension is that yeah, the Hilbert space of n anions of type A has, at large n becomes dA to the n. Right, so it's what happens if you over and over keep fusing anions of type A with themselves. How big a dimension you get. So yeah, and it doesn't need to be an integer because this is an asymptotic formula. If it's one, it means the Hilbert space is one dimensional for every n, that means it's an abelian anion. Okay, so you can see that that, that agrees with this case. If it, well, at least if I set a equal to one here, I get da equals one. So the vacuum is abelian, which it should be. Um, okay, I said the next case is the information convex set of the two-hole donut, the two-hole disk. And now to think about the two-hole disk, the right thing to do is notice that each of these, we can think about the thickened boundary of the two-hole disk. Right? Just thicken the boundary a little bit. And given a density matrix on the two-hole disk, we can make a density matrix on each of those thick components of the thickened boundary, each of which is an annulus. We can decompose any state into a, a convex combination of extreme points. And the extreme points will have, a, in an extreme point of the whole thing, it'll have to be an extreme point of each of these annuli. So I can label them. by anion types. And it'll turn out that this thing is the state space, I'll call it curly S, of some vector space associated with the two-hole disk, depending on the labels. This thing is some Hilbert space whose dimension is some integer, some positive, positive integer. Um, which, which, we, which we interpret as the fusion dimensions. And one thing that, that uh, Bowen and Isaac proved is that these two definitions of, of DA and NABC satisfy the, the con condition that they should, namely that DA, D 
AB is sum over C and ABC BC. That the quantum dimensions are, I feel like they're, they're eigenvectors of the, of the fusion coefficients. So yeah, using the axioms and strong subadditivity in a way that I'm not going to explain right now, uh, you, can, you can prove this equation. So that's why you should believe me that the, these are the right names to attach to these concepts. Yes? Exactly, yeah. So the comment is that what I'm saying smells like the axioms of TQFT. Yeah, so I'd like you to, so it, it's, it's very much related. And, and uh, indeed, I, the way you should think about it is, uh, well, okay, if I wanted to make a strong statement, I would say it's a proof that those are the right axioms. It, 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 okay, it is a proof that those are the right axioms if you believe me that, that these are the right axioms. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, but so, you know, I made a little bit of effort to convince you that these, these axioms are good. Um, and, and I guess maybe they're definitely, I can at least say that they're much more conservative than the topological field theory axioms in the sense that we're just starting from a single quantum state. Yeah. So at, yeah, at the very least, it's a different, different point of view. Okay. Um, the next comment is the same axioms essentially work in three dimensions, in three plus one dimensions. All I need to do, okay, sorry to those of you who are trying to take notes. All I need to do is make it draw a little rotation arrow there. So if you take the volume of rotation of this picture and the volume, oh, no, I did it wrong. Did it wrong. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, that actually matters. <laughs> there we go. The volume of rotation of this picture. So again, B and D are the thickened boundary. Now, B and D are the thickened boundary of a ball in three dimensions, dividing it into two, two, uh, two balls. Then these, exactly these same axioms uh, work. And what I mean by work is that they imply the same things I said over here, that uh, they're self-reproducing. The information convex set is a topological invariant. Uh, and actually, the other, the, other, the other interesting facts I'm going to tell you right now are also true. Um, and uh, in three plus one dimensions, there's a bewildering array of regions that we can consider. And I, maybe, yeah, I don't want to get too hung up on it or draw too many pictures. But let me just give a hint. So the first thing we can consider is what, you know, what's the analog of the annulus in three dimensions? Yes? Sure. Great, great, yeah. Um, yes, the question is, which axioms do, do fractons violate? Um, well, you can see that they'll defini it'll definitely need to violate, uh, it'll, it needs to violate at least one of A1 and A0, because, because this won't be true. Right? We should get a different, different super set of super selection sectors depending on where we put our anion detector. Um, and, I, and I think the answer is that it violates A1, but maybe it violates both. Don't, yeah, don't, don't trust me on that answer. OK. Right, so there should be a different set of axioms that tell you that your ground state is a fracton, a fracton state. And I don't know what they are yet. Yeah. Great. Um, so right, so one, one generalization of the annulus is um, the sphere shell. Right, so I, I guess I can, I can try to draw a sphere shell. Right, it's the yeah, take a ball, cut out the, cut out the inside, Sounds more violent than I intended. Um, and, and so that you can see from the kind of picture I drew before that this is going to detect particles. Right? So this, so ex in fact, ex extreme points of this detect part um, topological particle excitations. But there's a second generalization of the, of the um, annulus in higher dimensions, which is the solid torus. And in this case, we can draw an excitation that's, that's created by a membrane whose boundary is a loop. And this detects topological loops. OK, so now maybe I should just leave it to your imagination to uh, ask you to you know, think of a set of regions in three, in three dimensions. Um, and you can try to associate to each of them some set of topological excitations. So for example, we could draw, um, we could draw the complement of a knot. Man, I practiced like all night trying to. <laughs> uh, what happened? <laughs> okay, we draw. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> Let me try one more time. One more time. No. 
this one is supposed to attach to that one. There we go. Okay, I did it. Woo! All right. Um, oh, oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I, I want you to imagine that this is some thickened region, right? I, I remove I remove this thing that I drew from R three, um, and so it's a it's a region, and you can think about its infor information complex set. But actually, it's a theorem that this is the same as the information complex set of the of the solid torus. So that one was kind of boring. You might be disappointed. It's because not only is the information complex set invariant under this kind of deformation where the thing doesn't touch itself, it's actually invariant under regular homotopy, meaning that we can move parts of it through itself. And yeah, so that's boring. But if instead I ask about the information coming set of the complement of the knot, everything but the thing I drew there, so I'm not going to try to draw it again, so now just, let's just reinterpret the same picture. <laughs> this is, yeah, the complement. Okay, let me, there we go, S3 minus that, or the, the ball minus that. Then, well, it's excitations that are shaped like knots, <laughs> right? Because the idea is the excitation is in here, right? The excitation is somewhere inside that thickened knot. Because you know, remember, the information complex set, a state in the information complex set is allowed to do whatever it wants in the complement of the region. And there's some ciphered surface. The operator that creates it is some ciphered surface that goes through the region, some, some two dimensional disk whose boundary is the knot. Okay. So I, I hope this is enough to convince you that there's a big variety of things in three dimensions, and so it's worth thinking a little harder about the structure of the information comic set in general. And uh, the most important dichotomy is exactly between this, this, this one that I described here, between whether it's a simplex or whether it's, it's like a, whether there's a Hilbert space associated to it. And um, um, the, the basic, there's a very simple criterion on the region in order that its information convex set is a simplex. So a region is said to be sectorizable if, it's, if, if you can divide it in half, let's call it R and L, where each of R and L can be extended to omega again. So the picture you should have in mind, so the annulus is an example of a sectorizable region. I can cut it into, into two pieces, each of which is again an annulus. Two disjoint pieces, yeah, I, I should say. Yeah, R is disjoint from L. Um, and I claim that you cannot do this for the, cannot do this for the two-hole disk. Okay, so a, a very direct consequence of this definition is that if a, uh, if a region is sectorizable, yeah, let, let me just say it this way. So if this is true, then uh, is a simplex. The extreme points are, are orthogonal. So now let's think about what happens if it's not. So if we have a region that's not sectorizable, like this one, we can consider its thickened boundary. I claim, and you can convince yourself pretty quickly if you think about it, that the thickened boundary of any region is always sectorizable. In this example, it's just three copies of the annulus, so you can see that it's true. And like I said over here, that means that we can label the, the in sectors of the information convex set of such a region by the, the states, the extreme points of the thickened boundary. And so the, the, the big theorem about the structure of the information convex set is that the information convex set of a general region is the convex hull. Okay, let me, yeah, I, I, don't, I actually don't know what the right notation is for the convex hull of something. Convex hull of, let's call it sigma i of omega, where I here is a label on the extreme point of the thickened boundary. So I here labels uh, the extreme points of the information convex set of the thickened boundary of omega. And now I need to tell you what this is. So like in that, in that example of the two-hole disk, the statement is that this is uh, the state space, the space of density matrices on a Hilbert space, which we can call vi of omega. Um, and let me try to give some intuition for, for what that space is, because I'm going to use it in, in an important way in just a minute. Okay. So 
the what I'm about to write is um, a general yeah, a general statement about what does it, so if a state is a quantum Markov chain, what does it look like? Yeah, so a quantum Markov chain, uh, yeah, it looks like this. So if um, let's see, I guess the, yeah, the, the 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 quantum Markov chain that I want to think about, yeah, maybe I should draw it again. Let's think about something like this. Here's a here's my two hole disk. I draw a thickened boundary. Let's call that A. Then I draw a thickened boundary of what's left. Let's call that B. This is A, this is A, sorry, this is A, this is B, sorry, they're small. The idea is that A is the outermost boundary, B is the sort of interior of the boundary, and then C is the, the juicy filling of the region. OK, so a state, a quantum Markov chain uh, on that thing, on that region, looks like the following. It's a, we can write it as a sum. Well, OK, you know what? Let's fix the sector of the thickened boundary. So I labels a sector of, of A. It's, it's of the following form. Where B left and B right are some sort of fuzzy decomposition of the region B. So the statement is that the Hilbert space of B can be written as a direct sum of a part where this participates and a part where this participates. And then maybe there's some other factors in there. So it's not, it's not, it doesn't mean that it factorizes exactly. Um, well, oh, I guess it, sorry, it means that it factorizes. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it's not, a, it's not a factorization according to regions of space, right? So there's, a, it, the way you should think about it is there's some notion of a fuzzy region. There's some division between the outer part and the inner part, which isn't, it's not really a sharp division, but uh, yeah, so there's some notion of a fuzzy region who, who's, yeah, so whose Hilbert space is uh, this interior part. HBRC is, this is, yeah, it's not the Hilbert space of some region, but this is a subspace of HBC, and it's a superspace of HC. So it's somewhere, somewhere in between. Okay, and the most the reason I wrote this down is because I need this Hilbert. I need the, I need to talk about these states. The way you should think about these these pure states that I've written here is so yes. Yeah, so the, the idea is that this v of v i of omega is spanned by these states that I just wrote down, and we could choose them to be orthonormal. And you should think of them as like the low energy states. Okay, so one more yeah one more. Uh, sort of piece of background about entanglement bootstrap. So I said that uh, if we have a quantum Markov chain, it solves this marginal problem. Uh, a further statement is that this, that unique state that you get, that you're guaranteed by the quantum Markov condition, is also an element of the information convex set. So the condition plays well with the definition of information convex set. And therefore, we can merge density matrices. So given some states in a density matrix of part of the system, some states, yeah, so let me draw a picture. So suppose I wanted to make a three-hole annulus, a th yeah, three-hole thing. One way to do it is like this. So I can make it from this two-hole disk and this two-hole disk and merge them together along this buffer region. Another way I could do it is to take this two-hole disk and this two-hole disk and mer merge them together along the buffer region. And then you see I can label, oh, I, I can't see what labels I put on them before. Uh, OK, I can label these things. So those are, those are the same in each of the pictures. But then there's, there's a, a label on this guy here and a different label on that guy. And I hope you guys recognize these pictures from Meng's lectures. Um, so there's a theorem. Maybe, you know what, let me, not just say, let me not say the general theorem. The special case of the theorem applied to this example is that uh, the dimension of the fusion space of this three-hole annulus is determined by the dimensions of the fusion spaces. D. So this is a sum A, B, what is this letter supposed to be? E, uh, sum of E, but it's also this number. Uh, this one is F. 
F. So I, this one I did there. Here I did B C, B C F, F A, D. Right. So this was this was a uh, another result of topological field theory that uh, that can be understood from this point of view. Okay. So one of my excuses for subjecting you all to this subject is that something that we can understand. So included amongst all the, all the universal data about the phase of matter is what are its generalized symmetries. All right, that's a property of the phase of matter. And so we can, in fact, we can extract, well, that's a bad noise. We can extract generalized symmetry operators from this uh, starting point. And here's the idea. We can define yeah, an algebra of flexible operators. Okay, so first, oh yeah, first I need to define an equivalence relation. So given given two operators acting on on our Hilbert space, I'm going to call them uh, equivalent on some region omega if they act the same way on this low energy Hilbert space. Uh, if when I act with act with each, each of them on the reference data, I get the same answer, and it basically means that yeah, they act the same way on on this on this Hilbert space. Okay, and a similar condition on A dagger. By the algebra of flexible operators, I mean the set of bounded operators on, on the region omega. Uh, this is, I guess, yeah, this is this reduced density matrix on omega. Um, bounded operators in the region such that, okay, a certain condition is true. The condition is a little complicated. Bear with me. Okay, this, the condition star is that for any region, Let's call it zeta. It's a subregion of this, which is which can be obtained from omega. So, so say this is omega. It can be obtained from omega by two steps. One step is removing interior balls. So I could remove another ball from here. And the second step is deformation retraction. So I can smush it. So, so the, the so for example, in this case, zeta could could look like that. Let me draw it in a different color. Zeta could be this. Uh, Non-manifold theta. So for all regions that you can get that way, yeah, okay, obtained basically by deformation retraction and removing balls. Okay, Bowen would be mad at me if I don't say that. Um, fr from omega, yeah. If for every region there's a representative of the operator in this sense, so for every, so there exists, yeah, there exists an operator. Supported on zeta, so it's times the identity on the complement of zeta, um, which is equivalent uh, to a, which is equivalent to the original original one. Okay, so it's a little complicated, but the idea is the idea behind it is an an operator is flexible if you if you can find an operator that does basically the same thing on any deformation of the region. Right, any any shrinking of the region or deformation of the region. Okay, so like in the case of if the region we were talking about were a, a torus, then the, the region to think about would be some, something like this. Right, this I'm, here I'm removing a ball from the torus. What did I do? Yeah. Removing a ball from the torus, we get something like that. Uh, so we could deform. Uh, there has to be a representative of the operator for any choice of the sort of region. Okay, so that's a definition. So far, it's just a set, but it's a fact that this is an algebra. Yeah, it's an algebra in the sense that if I multiply two of them, I get I get a third one. Of course, I can add them, but I can, the, the non-trivial statement is that I can multiply them, and the multiplication respects the equivalence relation. Okay, and in fact, it's an algebra with lots of lots of nice with, with lots of structure. Um, it's a okay. I could say lots of fancy algebra words to try. Okay, uh, but I, I will restrict. I will not. And the reason I will not is because it's actually a very simple algebra. It's actually just a multi-matrix algebra. It's like a direct sum of finite dimensional uh, matrix algebras. And so let me let me tell you what they are. So in fact, K of omega is the direct sum in the sense of algebras of what we might call Ki of omega. And Ki of omega 
So I here is a label on the extreme points of the thickened boundary of omega, like before. OK, I is, let's just say it's spanned by these operators. Um, I could call them q i i j, which is these things. It's just you know matrices acting on this Hilbert space. Okay, so if you know the information convex set, you know the you know this algebra of flexible operators. And uh, notice that these are op these are operators that are not they're not they're not necessarily supported on manifolds. They're not necessarily invertible. So so they're symmetry operators in the sense that they preserve the density matrix. Um, but indeed, they're, they're some sort of generalized symmetry operators. OK, so to see what we can do with these operators, I need to introduce a little bit, a little bit more technology. I'm sorry. I need to define something called pair, a pairing manifold. And one reason that I, we might want to do this is um, to extract, in addition to these other properties of topological field theory, to extract the S matrix. So, you know, anions can braid around each other. And uh, uh, actually, one, one uh, axiom of topological field theory that Meng mentioned is remote detectability. This is the idea that each anion, can, can, its presence can be detected by some other anion, by some other topological excitation, without touching it right, <laughs> remotely. Um, and this is, yeah, so this is an axiom of topological field theory, which we can prove from this point of view. And the key ingredient is, uh, is the pairing manifold. So, so yeah, the statement is basically just that any, every anion participates in a invertible, in a unitary S matrix. OK, so another motivation for asking this question, for, to, for talking about this, is you probably think about topological field theory as this machine that, that where you have to talk about co complicated manifolds, right? Like, you know, lens spaces and things. And it spits out a number. Right, but here we have a you know a prior you know a real paucity of non-trivial manifolds. Right, we're just thinking about a state on the ball. How could I possibly talk about the state on some, you know, lens space or something like that? And so, uh, let me answer that question. So it, it so first let's make closed manifolds. I guess then the goal is to make is to talk about that. So to make a closed manifold, here's the idea. There's two steps. The first step is the notion of immersions. I already mentioned this. The idea is we could define the information convex set not just on regions that are subsets of the ball, but regions that are immersed in the ball. So what I mean by that is, sorry to those of you who are trying to live tech this. Um, <laughs> uh, what I mean by that is, th so this picture, each point in this picture is meant to represent a point in our, uh, a sub it's, this is a subset of the ball, but here, in this region, maybe I should. Here, in this region, uh, we're using it twice, right? So this, it's a, here it's a double cover of the of the of the space, and I claim we can we can define uh, states. We can define the information convex set of this region, because what do we need to to study the information convex set? We just need to be able to compare for each little ball here whether this whether a given density matrix on this monstrosity is the same as the reduced density matrix on the ball of our reference state. And so for example, here, if, if I'm given a state on this big thing, I can compare its state on the top sheet. And I can also compare its state on the bottom sheet with the, with the reference state. So there's no problem studying immersions. OK, immersed regions. The second ingredient is, uh, so now if you want to make a state on a closed manifold, like say this torus here, what you do is you immerse you're, well, so first you put, poke a hole in the torus, so the torus can't be immersed in the ball by itself. But if you poke a hole in it, it can. Here is a picture of a punctured torus immersed in a ball, or right, the ball is some bigger region of the blackboard. And then the, the final step is divide that thing up into regions, on each of which you can construct states. Right? So we can. So the annulus, we know about the states on the annulus. Right? The information coming set of the annulus is just. Extreme points are, are the anions. Similarly, we can construct states on this thing. We can construct, say, a vacuum state on this thing. The most important thing is that this yellow boundary here, the yellow boundary becomes the, this yellow boundary here, if 
under some, uh, under some conditions on the state of the yellow boundary, so that it's an annulus, so I can, it's well defined to ask whether it's in the vacuum state. The final step, this is step two I'm going to write up there, is to heal the puncture. So what I mean by that is we attach to it some degrees of freedom that purify the system, and then just regard all of those points, this whole yellow boundary, and those whatever degrees of freedom we have to add, as just, a, just some point there. Identify them with a point. And the non-trivial fact is that we can show that the axioms are still satisfied in the neighborhood of this point. OK, so that was probably too fast. But the idea is we can study closed manifolds in this way. OK, now there's this, I wish I could, oh yeah, I can leave it, OK. Now there's a special class of closed manifolds that we're going to be interested in, which have the following property. They're called, yeah, so step two is heal the punctures. which have the following properties. So here's another picture of the torus. A property of the torus is that you can divide it in half in two ways. The first way is like, is like the one I drew there. So there's a red annulus here. Let's call that x. The complement of, so the complement of x is x bar. So the annulus is, the, so the torus is two copies of the annulus. There's a second way I can divide it in half. Which is, which is like this. So this is y. So y is this yellow region, and what, y bar is that re, yellow. The compl it's complement. It's, y is also an annulus. So you see there, there are two ways I can divide the torus in half. Um, and a key property of this way of dividing the torus in half is that x intersect y is a ball. Right? This is x intersect y. It's a ball. And the same is true for x bar intersect y, and the same is true for x intersect y bar, and the same is true for x, the other one, x intersect, x bar intersect y bar. All of their intersections are balls. And the way you should think about this is suppose I have a state on the whole torus. I can think about the reduced density matrix on x, right? That's a state on the annulus. A state on y knows absolutely nothing about which sector the state on x is in. Because the reduced density matrix is just a ball. And there, there's a unique state in the information coming out of the ball. So the state, the state, this condition is that, yeah, the state on y has no information about the state on x. And there's, there's sort of an uncertainty principle between the two of them. If, you, if, I, if I specify a state on x, in fact, the state on y has to be maximally uncertain, and vice versa. OK. Um, a, a pairing manifold is a manifold on which we can make a state which satisfies these topological conditions and then a few more conditions that I'm not going to tell you. Um, and uh, with, those, with those conditions, given a state on the pairing manifold, we can define, uh, we can define the S matrix. We can construct the S matrix. The idea is that there's a basis of states on M which are associated with the extreme points of X. Right? So yeah, extreme points of X. leads to one basis of states. I don't know, let's call them A. Uh, let's say V, yeah, V of M is spanned by these states A, labeled by extreme points of X. Extreme points of Y lead to another basis. The same Hilbert space is spanned by a different basis. I don't know, let's call them alpha. In the notation here, I'm assuming that they're sectorizable, like in this example. But it's actually quite a bit more general. And then there's a matrix we can make, which is just the overlaps. All right, these are two different bases of the Hilbert space. The, the matrix that takes one basis to the other is manifestly unitary. And, uh, and it's the S matrix. Right, so this is, this is associated with the, this label is associated with excitations detected by X. Right, so this, you know, imagine this picture again. This is associated with excitations detected by y, and this is a pairing between them, okay, which is manifestly, yeah, manifestly unitary. Okay. Um, so yeah, I said that this, this definition of pairing manifold is a little bit restrictive, restrictive, but in fact, we have many, many examples. Um, so the simplest example is the torus that I've actually drawn. I'm not going to draw the analogous picture in other cases. <laughs> uh, even that one kind of you know, taxes my ability to draw it in finite time. Uh, but one particular interesting one is S2 times S1 in three dimensions, uh, which, so this one, 
proves remote detectability of anions in two plus one dimensions. This proves remote detectability of particles and loops in three plus one dimensions. So this is a pairing between the sphere shell and the solid torus. Um, and so one thing it proves, not only is the S matrix unitary, sorry, but in particular, it means that the number of particle excitations is always equal to the number of loops, which was another theorem of TQFT that Meng mentioned. Um, OK. OK, I think I did it. There's one more thing I want to say about um, gapped entanglement bootstrap, which I, I guess I just can't resist, which is um, starting from, so if a region participates in a pairing manifold, there's a second basis for its algebra of flexible operators. So we saw a basis associated with its own information convex set, but, but there's a second basis, which is uh, basically the idea is we can make these special states on x. So this, this is a state on, in the Hilbert space of the pairing manifold. We can, there's a set of operators, flexible operators, uh, supported on y that make them. And, 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 well, basically, actually, there's a simple formula for these guys in terms of the other ones. This is the S matrix. OK, let me, maybe I'll write the simplest case. Yeah, OK. It's just determined by the sorry, sum over A. And so, so I claim that these things uh, span K of X. No, they span K of Y. And uh, they have an operator algebra. So it's, it's an algebra, which means that if I multiply them, I have to get another one. So I can define a set of structure constants by, the, by that fact. And uh, uh, one thing that we can prove sim simply by thinking about the following matrix elements Just think about this in, in two different ways. One way you can think about it is ask what it does to this state. This is the state on y. This is a sort of minimally entangled state on y. Or you could ask what it does to this. And this is, that, that second one uses the operator algebra. Thinking about that in two ways, it immediately follows that the structure constant is equal to this combination of the S matrices. which is a Verlinde formula. But it's, a, it's actually a pretty big generalization of the Verlinde formula, because it's, I didn't actually say what kind of excitations these were. Right? For any, for any uh, excitations whose regions participate in pairing manifolds, there's such a formula. Um, one difference from the usual Verlinde formula is that actually, it's not obvious that these things are integers, or even that they're positive. I, or even if they're, if they're real from what I said, there are some cases where we can prove that they're integers. But I think it's actually not always true. OK. Questions? OK. Yeah, please. Great. So the, the, the question is, for the case of 3 plus 1 dimensional liquid bosonic topological order, isn't there an expectation that they're all finite group gauge theories? Um, and indeed, that statement definitely appears in the topological field theory literature. And there are actually various proofs of it from various starting assumptions. Um, I don't know how to prove it from this starting point. I don't even know if it's true from this starting point. Um, I do not. I do not have a counterexample. Yeah. That's right. And so, yeah, so one, indeed, one very important question from this point of view is, so in two plus one dimensions, we sort of know what a finite set of data is, both from the point of view of entanglement bootstrap and from the point of view of TQFT. In three plus one dimensions, I, you know, as I said, there's this sort of bewildering array of, re array of regions you could consider, and I don't know relations between that, between that data yet. Um, 
like the information common set of the complement of any particular not. A priori could be independent information, which is clearly not if they're just finite group <laughs> gauge theories. Yeah. So that yeah, that's an important question. Okay. So in the last ten minutes, um, I want to talk about one plus one D CFT from this point of view. So what's the analogous, analogous condition? So the condition, a condition on the entropies is actually not sufficient. But one thing we know uh, is that in the ground state, we know not just the, the form of the entropy, but the whole form of the entanglement Hamiltonian. And it looks like this. So for any, so in the case of an integral, in the case of a single integral, it looks like this. Where h of x is the Hamiltonian density of the actual CFT, and then there's a constant term. So for those of you who are worried about the well-definedness of the entanglement Hamiltonian, let me just remind you the entanglement Hamiltonian is defined to be uh, e to the minus k of the reduced density matrix. It's the reduced density matrix, the log of the reduced density matrix. Um, all of the UV stuff, all of the UV horrors are in there. And this thing is totally well defined. And this beta of one, x1, x2 is just a quadratic, it's a locally quadratic function. Maybe should I just draw it? It looks like that. Here's x1, here's x2, here the slope is 1, here the slope is 1. That uniquely specifies it. This is beta. You can figure out what it is. Um, and how do we know this? We know that, well, one way to think about it is from the bisignano wickman theorem. Right? That's the statement that in any relativistic CFT, the entanglement Hamiltonian for half of the space is the boost generator. It's, it's easiest to think about this from the point of view of the path integral. It's just the thing that evolves you from, yeah, here's my, here's the region I, whose entanglement I want to know about. In the path integral, I just, to reconstruct the density matrix, I just need to think about that generator, which is just x, which is just x times the Hamiltonian density. And then this half interval in the case of a CFT is related by a conformal transformation to a finite interval. Okay, that's, or you can just write a path integral. Okay, so, so far, so far this is just a fact about CFT in one plus one dimensions, but a non-trivial fact is that a certain, so quadratic functions, yeah, the, the crucial thing is this, this function is quadratic. Maybe, okay, let me actually write it. x minus x1, x2 minus x, divided by x2 minus x1, right? That's what it is. It's just a quadratic function. And quadratic functions, how to say, are not, are not that expressive. There's only so much you can do. And if you have access to a, a whole collection of quadratic, locally quadratic functions, you can find linear combinations that vanish. And so I claim that the following, using this formula, the following combination of entanglement Hamiltonians, this, this term just cancels. So it's um, KAB plus KBC, okay, I guess maybe it's better to write it this way. Uh, eta times KAB plus KBC minus KA minus KC. So you recognize this is the same combination that appeared in delta. Right? So this, I'm going to call this delta hat. Plus 1 minus eta times KAB plus KBC minus KB minus KABC. And you recognize this, oh, I, I think I didn't define the conditional neutral information. You recognize this as the same combination that appears in the conditional neutral information if I had written it. Okay, so so far this is, I'm just defining a linear combination of things. And eta here is the cross ratio. Just the geometric cross ratio of the sizes of those regions. I guess yeah, I should have said, here's A, here's B, here's C, X1 x2, x3, x4. Um, this com so if you, if you plug in this formula for beta into this combination using this, this part just cancels. Just goes away. Which means that what's left is a C number. And its coefficient happens to be C times the binary entropy function of eta over 3. So it's as if, as if eta were a probability and so this is eight, minus eta log eta plus one minus eta log one minus eta. Okay, so why is, why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because we could try to impose it as a condition on the ground state. 
Where did that come from? <gasps> oh. I'm going to use the, the board on the bottom. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to rebel. I'm going to rebel here. <laughs> OK. Um, so, so this is, yeah, so I, this is a condition that's true in the continuum. Uh, I'd like to impose it on a, on a lattice wave function. Imagine someone hands you a quantum critical wave function. They tune, they tune their lattice model to a critical point. You believe at low energy is described by a CFT. You can ask whether this condition is true. It's true that the entanglement Hamiltonian is a little bit dangerous, especially on a lattice, because it can have a kernel. The, the density matrix can have a kernel, which means its log has some singularities. A nicer thing to do is to act on the state. This, this, can, so this is a weaker condition, right? I mean, it's, it's a condition of about the action of this operator on a single state rather than its statement, its operation on the whole Hilbert space. If, if, you, check, if you check this condition, in, in, in any lattice model, it turns out to be, in, in any quantum critical lattice model that's supposed to realize the CFT, uh, it turns out to be true. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, it turns out to be, despite the fact that we derived it from this continuum formula, it actually turns out to be a true statement. And so we can use it, we can imagine, so let's, yeah, I'm going to call this the fixed point condition. We could try to use this as the thing that replaces A0 and A1 in the case of CFT. And so, okay, this raises two questions. One is, how do I know it's a sufficient condition? And two, uh, how do I figure out what all the universal data I should extract is? There's a, to answer that second question, there's a sort of cheat, which is, if I have a Hamiltonian, surely, you know, I can find its ground state, and surely, that if I know the Hamiltonian, it has all of the information in it. So, yeah. It's not exactly true. Oh. Yeah, but it, it becomes more and more true as you make the system bigger. But it's, it's already for pretty small systems, it's, pretty, it's very true. It's surprisingly true. Yeah, I don't understand yet the finite size scaling, but yeah, it's surprisingly true. So one thing we can do as a sort of cheat is we can reconstruct the Hamiltonian from the same data. So suppose we have access to the entanglement Hamiltonians. Um, the picture, yeah, the picture I, I have in mind here is, suppose our state is on the circle. We can divide this, the continuum theory up into regions and regard each of these as a site. So this thing is site one, this is site two, this is site three. It has an infinite dimensional Hilbert space in the continuum theory. But let me nevertheless regard them each as a site. Then I can think about the following combination Following combination of entanglement Hamiltonians. So this thing, this is the, the reduced density matrix of two, two, sorry, the entanglement Hamiltonian of two contiguous sites. This is the entanglement Hamiltonian of one of them. And this combination is chosen so that if you plug in that formula up there, it just becomes this. So if you use the continuum formula, uh, the, the, and this formula for beta, the, those quad, locally quadratic functions just add up to a constant. And, but, but this is an expression that you could use on the lattice. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's given a state, it's a Hamiltonian that you could, you know, whose, whose spectrum you could think about. And if you compare the spectrum of this Hamiltonian at one of those quantum critical points I was just describing, it, it, it's spot on, even in finite size. Okay, the next surprise is that this condition, this condition here, is the condition for a certain function to be stationary. So what I mean by this is, okay, so the, and the function is just take the expectation value of this. Just, so it's, it's just replace every k with an s. That's what I mean by s delta. And so what, what I mean by this variation is just in the space of states, just look at its variation in every direction and ask, ask, ask what it is, and if it's a, it, yeah, a, a saddle point of this function satisfies this condition. So this is some function on the space of states, which if the, if the Hilbert space is finite dimensional, it's, you know, it's, 
you can imagine that there, there's you know, some finite, finite set of coordinates on the space of states. And each of these saddle points is a state that satisfies uh, these conditions. Oh, something I said, should have said, sorry. By the same logic, we can reconstruct not just the Hamiltonian, but all of the global conformal generators. So it's, it's actually pretty plausible that the fixed points of this function are, sorry, the, the saddle points of this function are fixed points of the normalization group. And so, okay, here's the, here's the cheekiest thing. Uh, here's the cheekiest part of it. So here I imagine draw, dividing this up into a whole, you know, this continuum field theory into regions and thinking about each of these regions as an infinite dimensional Hilbert space on each site. Instead, let me just think about the following very crude thing. Divide it up into just four regions and, th and just replace each of these things by a qubit, just a single qubit. Right, so I'm talking here about just a two to the four dimensional Hilbert space. On that two to, four, two to the four dimensional Hilbert space, I can evaluate this function right, for every, every state in the Hilbert space. Let's restrict ourselves to, let's say, symmetric symmet states that are translation invariant and let's say time reversal invariant just, for, just to make it easier. So there's, I think, a, a five, five or six dimensional space of states and we can just compute this function. All right, so, the, so this, yeah, this axis is S delta on this, on this Hilbert space. And we can, we can find its saddle points. And if you look at the list of its saddle points, there, there are, in the case where the states are qubits, there are seven of them, eight of them, something like that. There are two, kind, there are two kinds of saddle points. Well, there's a, there's a maximum, because you know, this combination, of, it's just a you know, bounded function of entropies. There's a maximum. And there's zero. There's some cases where it's zero. And in between, there are, some, there are some interesting examples. And three of them we can identify with known CFTs with small central charge. We find the Ising model, we, and we find two, two points with C equals one. The height of the function at the critical point, you're just looking at this formula, is proportional to the central charge. So we can read off the central charge, and we can compute the spectrum of, this, of the re reconstructed Hamiltonian and compare it to the spectrum of the associated, expected you know, list of primaries. Um, OK, thank you. Yeah, so maybe, maybe uh, this, is, this, this, is, this is where I'll stop. So, um, so, that, you know, this is, so the idea is, the, at least the picture that I have in mind, is when this Hilbert space is just qubits, only, only, only small CFTs will fit, right? Only CFTs with very small central charge. Um, that's why we only found ones with small central charge. And if we do this with, with bigger local Hilbert spaces, we, we find more CFTs, more, more, more saddle points. Um, and so actually this, this uh, suggests a way in which you could just look for all the CFTs, right? Just make bigger and bigger local Hilbert spaces and you know, do some gradient descent to find the saddle points of this function. And uh, uh, and all the, all the CFTs should appear. <laughs> um, so so it's sort of a different different very different uh, approach to bootstrapping CFTs, right? So there was no input about any you know any Hamiltonian or anything, um, but nevertheless uh, a very approximate description of of uh, interesting CFTs is coming out. So I, I don't know I don't know how practical that is, but yeah, but we'll keep trying. Um, so okay, so that was a very brief description of entanglement bootstrap for one plus one dimensional CFTs. A uh, similar story that I didn't get to tell you uh, obtains in the case of two plus one dimensional topological states with, with chiral modes at the boundary, with a CFT living at the boundary. And so, that, so that's, that's three categories of states that we've considered. Of course, there are many more possibilities, uh, which I urge you to consider, to try to consider from this point of view and figure out what the right, what the right axioms are. OK, thanks for listening. Run. Well, in view of the time, I think we'll postpone any questions for John until afterwards. Let's thank him one more time for this wonderful lecture series. Thank you. And so we ha we have reached the end. Um, so there, there's a few people that we would like to thank. So why don't we start with Jane and Mara here? So. 
and, and, uh, and Joseph. So th these have been uh, the staff members who have helped you, helped coordinate TASI, put everything together for you. We would not have been able to do any of this without them. So I'd like a big round of applause and appreciation for all their hard work. Do you want to say anything? So this was my first year kind of coordinating this, and I just want to thank you all for being so responsive and so nice to me and um, kind of helpful along the way. Even when I had questions, we were kind of in it together. So I appreciate each and every one of you, and I hope you all enjoyed Tassie as much as I have enjoyed being there for you all. Thanks to all of you. Um, let's see, next I would like to again acknowledge all of the wonderful lecturers for the whole, uh, the whole month. Let's give another round of applause for all of them. And, and one more time for the three wonderful scientific organizers who put the program together. So Ken and Trilligator, Ibu Ba, and Shu Heng, who's here, or where is he? Right there. So to all three of you from, from me, thank you so much for putting together this wonderful program. And for me personally, I'm, I'm grateful to my co-director, Ethan, to Tom, who ran Tassie for many years, for all of their assistance in, in putting this all together. So this is it. We've thanked a lot of people. But there's one more group of people that I want to acknowledge, which is all of you. So it's been a real pleasure to talk to you, to hear your questions, to get to, to know you uh, a little bit over the course of the last four weeks. I know I will be continuing to see many of you in the years to come. Many of the people I went to Tassie with are still active in the field and doing things and run into them at conferences and workshops and so on. So this is sort of the, the, the beginning of knowing you all um, as, as fellow physicists and colleagues. So it's been great to get to know you. And uh, yeah, how about one more round of applause from you all to each other for making this school what it was.